Well, good morning, friends. My name is Matt, and I have the joy and privilege of serving as the pastor here. And this morning, we're beginning a new series of messages that will take us through the end of the school year, and we're going to look and, and walk through Romans chapter 8. For many people, Romans 8 has been called the jewel of Scripture, and my hope is that over the next several weeks, we'll take this gem that is Romans 8 and turn it every so often every week and let the light dance and swim around it that we can see what Romans 8 has to show us and teach us about who Jesus is and about what the gospel, uh, what difference the gospel makes in our lives. And why is Romans 8 so beautiful? Because it deals with one of the deepest longings that all of us are looking for. It, one of the deepest needs that we're all trying to fill, an emptiness that all of us are seeking some way uh, to fill up. And, and what is that desire? What is that longing? Well, in a word, it's assurance. Romans 8 is a chapter about assurance. We're all longing for someone to look at us and to say, you're okay. We're all looking for someone to come into the midst of our circumstances and situation and say, everything is going to be okay. We need someone to come up to us when we're uncertain about the future, uh, when we're anxious and worried about what lies ahead. We need somebody to come, to, come up to us and say, everything will be all right. It, it's going to be okay. And Romans chapter 8 is God's de- most definitive, clear, unambiguous declaration of assurance that the Christian has to hold on to. And so we're going to explore this chapter together. Romans 8 is this wonderful piece of scripture that it, it's, it's a little bit dense and, and there's a lot uh, of moving pieces in the chapter. And so we're going to work verse by verse slowly through, the, through, the, through Romans 8 over the next several weeks because Paul has this really great argument Uh, to give to believers, followers of Jesus about the assurance that God has for those who believe in him. Romans 8 can can really be summarized in this question of, is God for me? If you've ever wondered, is God for me? Romans 8 gives you uh, a resounding and unequivocal, uh, a resounding yes that God is for you. Romans 8 ends with this climax of praise, and Paul asks a series of devastating questions that are meant to uh, dismantle and destroy all the fears and worries and anxieties that we have about life. Romans 8 ends this way. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, in not so many words, Paul is saying that there is absolutely nothing, zero, not a chance in in this universe or all the, the universes that can separate you from God's love. And so as we unpack this chapter of assurance over the next few weeks, I want to start and, and really frame the sermon series by going a little under the surface of saying if this chapter is about assurance, then why is it that we often lack assurance in our daily lives as we follow Jesus? That that if Christians really have the best resource for assurance, for knowing that God is for us, that God loves us, that there's nothing that's going to separate us from his love, then why is it that we we feel and look just as anxious as as people who don't believe in Jesus? Um, Why do we have just as much fear and anxiety about the future as people who, uh, who aren't people of faith. And as we look at our own lives and we see the chaos and the lack of control that we have, uh, what, what, what is it about the Christian life that we, we find ourselves lacking assurance? And so um, let's go there this morning. If it helps to have a roadmap, that there's really two things I want to talk about. I want to talk about, one, why we often lack assurance in our lives, and then second, what's the antidote? So whatever reason you lack assurance this morning, there is one antidote, and we'll get to that. But first, let's talk about the reasons that we lack assurance in the Christian life. And, and to this, as I've been thinking personally about the reasons why we lack assurance, I, I recall to mind uh, the words of a good friend of mine, James Forsyth. He was a former pastor of mine, and uh, he gives uh, four reasons why we often lack assurance in the Christian life. And, and we should say that it is one of the strange aspects of faith, right, that, that Christians uh, worry about not being Christians. And if you're here this morning as a, as a guest and you're not a Christian, you might think that's the weirdest thing in the world. Like, why would people who say they're Christians worry 
that they're not. But we know that if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know how natural it is to doubt uh, the sincerity of your faith, to doubt whether or not you're actually a Christian. Now, why would we even worry about that to begin with? Well, here's four reasons why. And, and here's how I think Romans 8 could speak to these different reasons why we lack assurance. The first reason that we might lack assurance is because of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. One of Satan's earliest schemes and one of his favorite designs is to try and tempt us into believing that God doesn't really love us, that, that God isn't for us. It was the first trick he pulled at the start of the Bible. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, he comes up to Adam and Eve and he tempts them to disbelief uh, that, that God is really for them. And if you go to the opening pages of the New Testament, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, Satan comes to Jesus with a similar, uh, with a similar line that God isn't really for him, that, that God doesn't really have his best interests in mind. And if, he, uh, and if he's that adept at using that, that scheme uh, to Eve in the garden, to Jesus uh, in the wilderness, you better believe that Satan is uh, out to try and tempt you to believe that God doesn't really care for you as well. And now, friends, on the one hand, it's, it's really important to celebrate that today we have no reason to be terrified of Satan. Why? Because Satan is terrified of Jesus. And if Romans 8 is true, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, that, that if Jesus is ours and we are his, then we absolutely have nothing to fear. But at the same time, uh, we don't want to be naive uh, about his schemes. In a different letter of Paul's in 2 Corinthians, he, he writes that we should not be ignorant of Satan's designs, and we should not be outwitted by his schemes either. And so you would bet that, that Satan would love for you today to start doubting God's love for you, that Jesus' heart for you. And he'd love to get a foothold in your life that way, and sometimes he does. And so when we lack assurance of our salvation, sometimes it might be because there's a spiritual battle going on. But secondly, though, the second reason that Christians might lack assurance is not spiritual warfare, but spiritual immaturity spiritual immaturity. Uh, it, this, this comes to us for, for people who know Christ, but who don't yet know him very well. Uh, we know Christ, but we don't know Christ very well. And so while uh, we truly know Jesus, we haven't spent much time with him in worship. Uh, we haven't spent much time with him in his word, uh, pulling out the promises of, in scripture that God has for his people. We don't really understand the certainty of our salvation in him. Or we might, you know, this immaturity might also look like uh, not, not spending enough time with Jesus in community, not surrounding ourselves with other brothers and sisters in the faith who are on this journey uh, of, of Christian life together to encourage you, to uplift your spirits, to remind you of what is true in him. Or, or maybe uh, spiritual immaturity looks like not being too involved in serving Jesus or being on mission for him. Because uh, you would be surprised at the moment that you start serving Jesus, you go out in the world with the intentionality to live for him, you're surprised at how often Jesus shows up in those moments when you step out of your comfort zone to, to live and follow uh, Jesus in, in, in serving him. But, you know, here's one other place where I see spiritual immaturity rising up just in, uh, just in my, my day out day in, day out ministry. And it's when we despair over, over when our prayers go unanswered, um, when our, our hopes for how something should turn out in life doesn't go the way that we, that we hoped, uh, or even if you know, the opposite uh, comes about. Maybe you're praying for a change in your circumstances, but things are only getting worse. Uh, and the disappointment or lack of assurance might just be because you're not grasping the fact that your agenda for your life might not be God's agenda for your life. That, that the way you think life should go is not the same way that God thinks life should go. And when that disconnect happens, we can lack assurance. But as, Roman 8 will sh but as Romans 8 will show us, God is not in the business of killing your joy. Rather, uh, God is in the business of leading you into the fullness of joy to, to show you that how all parts of your life work out for his glory and for your good. But sometimes, because of our spiritual immaturity, we lack assurance. Spiritual warfare, spiritual immaturity. But a third reason that we can lack assurance is, is friends, we can be honest in this moment, is it's just through our own sin. Uh, is through our, our own sin. Why? Because sometimes, uh, you know, we need to make the faith a little bit less mystical, right? Like, you know, following Jesus is a lot like our other earthly relationships. Uh, it suffers if you neglect it, and it also suffers if you actively harm it, 
right? So you might be living this passive Christian life, and then uh, if you're just following Jesus, going through the motions, don't be surprised that if over a period of time you find yourself drifting from Christ, drifting from life in Jesus. And also, if you're proactively caught in some hidden or or secret but persistent sin, it's going to cause a breach in your relationship with Christ. Now, not in a saving way, because there is nothing that separates you from the love of God, but it will create a separation in in your assurance uh, of God's love. And the reason why this happens is because God loves us too much to just let us go on our sinful way, to let us indulge in sins and, 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 feel, uh, no, and, and feel no remorse or disconnection from him because of it. And so at times God will withdraw, not salvation, but assurance of salvation. Why? So that we can return to him, so that we can come back to Christ and experience the joy uh, of life live with him. And if you're struggling with your faith or with your lack of assurance this morning, it might just be because of sin. But there, there's one more reason, and it's not just spiritual warfare or spiritual maturity or sin. Uh, but this is probably the most common one that we often lack assurance, and it's suffering. We often lack assurance of faith because of suffering, because of the things that have been done to us, the things that are happening in us and around us. And, and we understand this most most acutely, right? Like when, like when you uh, are the victim of abuse, of course it's natural to ask a question as if, does God really see me? Is he for me? Does he care? If, if you've recently lost a job or if you're in a job that you're not satisfied in, it's easy to, to, to wonder, is God really for me? Does, does he love me? Or, or when you have some kind of mental affliction or if uh, or if uh, you're in encountering a, a diagnosis, uh, it's natural in those moments to know uh, in suffering, does God really care about me? Is he for me? And friends, if, if you're in this room and you haven't uh, experienced a, a season of doubt or assurance of your salvation, I guarantee you that because of suffering, one day you will. Suffering causes us all to lack assurance at some point or another. So those are the reasons they're not all the reasons that that we lack assurance, but the good news of our text this morning is that whatever your reason, there is one antidote for your your lack of assurance. There is a panacea, and his name is Jesus. So whatever your your reasons are for for your lack of assurance in your faith this morning, there is one antidote, and his name is Jesus. We see this clear as day in the first verse of Romans chapter 8. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation, for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Well, just quickly, two things, and we'll, we'll unpack them together. First, uh, we'll first look at what it means to, that no condemnation. We'll see what that means. And then secondly, um, we'll see that no condemnation leads to liberation. It leads to freedom, to, to no slavery. So first, no condemnation. And in order for us to understand this, we need to do some catch-up. If you noticed, uh, Romans 8.1 begins with this word, therefore, and that means that Paul is summarizing a line of thought that he began earlier in the book of Romans. A lot of the commentators say you need to go back to Romans chapter 5 to understand what he's saying. And if you, you know, flip back a page or two in your worship guide, you'll see Romans 5.1. That's the, the kernel of Paul's thought there, that therefore there is, um, we, we've been justified by faith in Christ, that we now experience peace with God because of what Christ has done. But uh, we can even just go back one chapter to chapter 7 to see what Paul is getting at here. See, in chapter 7, Paul is writing about the reality that, that, he, that even as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, he still struggles with sin. Uh, he writes this in Romans 7, chapter, um, chapter 7, verse 15. He says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do what I do not what, uh, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see that my members, uh, in my members, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but, I'm, but with my flesh I am under the law of sin. In other words, Paul is saying that inside of himself there is this conflict, there are these dual realities, that he wants to obey the law of God. He has this deep love for God, but he's still being pulled along 
by the reality of sin and death in his life. He, he loves God, yet he's pulled along by, by these desires that, that he doesn't want uh, that he doesn't want, that he doesn't want to, to act on. And he's writing with this great realism about the world. You see, Paul isn't naive. He doesn't say that, uh, he's not selling a version of Christianity that when you believe in him, your life is always going to go up and to the right. You're never going to sin anymore. You're never going to experience any suffering. No, he says Christ has come into your life and he's given you the power to live differently, to live in light uh, of his resurrection, of his power in you by the Holy Spirit. And yet, at the same time, we still live in a world that's riddled with sin and death. We still struggle with the way that we used to live, the desires that, that we don't want to indulge, and we still are, are beset by the reality of death, that, that all people, even Christians, will die. But in the midst of those twin realities of sin and death, Jesus comes to you and says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what is no condemnation? Condemnation is a legal term. Uh, it's the guilty verdict. It's the judge that sides with uh, the plaintiff, if you're the defendant. Uh, more popularly, it's the voice of uh, Michelle Yeoh's character in Crazy Rich Asians when she confronts Rachel on the stairwell and says, you will never be enough. It, it's that voice that, that says you're, you're not measuring up. Uh, you're, you're guilty. You're not worthy. And uh, therefore, Paul is saying that, it, that if you're in Christ Jesus... There's no guilty verdict for you. There's no punishment. Uh, that God, the judge, is siding with you and not against you. He's declaring that, that you are enough, that you're okay. And, and it's not just a declaration. Paul is even being more emphatic because he goes a step further and he says, not only are you not condemned, he says there is no condemnation for you. There is no condemnation for you. The whole category of condemnation has been removed from your life. That It's not something that's going to come at you in the future. It's not going to be something that, that uh, sneaks up on you in the present. You've been removed from, con- from the category of condemnation altogether, and so it's not something that you need to think about or worry about anymore. See, this is basic Christianity, that in Christ we have been uh, set free from condemnation, that our judgment day has been uh, that our judgment day is no longer in the future, it's in the past. But because it's, be, because it's basic Christianity, the temptation for us is that it goes in one ear and out the other. Uh, but uh, this is a powerful statement, but it doesn't feel powerful for many of us because it, it really hasn't seeped into the bedrock of our souls. Because if we're honest, you know, most of us feel that when we come to Christ, our sins are forgiven, the slate's wiped clean, and so we have this air and lightness about us, but then we stumble into the old patterns that, that we used to live before we gave our life to Jesus, and then we feel condemnation. But, but, but then it's okay, because then we ask forgiveness, and the slaves are like clean, like cleaned again, and we go back out, living our, our merry way, and then we stumble and slip into condemnation and guilt again. That, that really the experience of the Christian life is just us moving in and out of condemnation all of the time on a, on a weekly, daily, hourly basis. But this passage says that in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus this is the legal metaphor here. We often praise God for his mercy and for his grace, but Romans 8, 1 says that we should praise God for his justice because, because God is a holy and, and just God. He's perfect in, in righteousness and justice. That means that he is not going to take two payments for one debt. Because God is just, he's not going to take two payments for one debt because if Christ came and condemned sin in his flesh, he's made, he's made the payment that God requires. And so you don't need to so you don't need to condemn yourself. You don't need to live in such a way where you're trying to offer God a payment for something that's already been paid for. God in his justice won't take two payments for one debt. That's what verse 3 is talking about, that, that Christ came for us. And you see Paul's logic at work here. Christ came not, at, not in the likeness of man because he was truly man. And he didn't come as, as a sinful man because he is God who is without sin. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin in order to condemn sin in the flesh. See, Jesus came not to condemn sinners, but he came to condemn sin. And because Jesus came to condemn sin, we can be set free from the condemnation that we often feel in our lives because of sin, the sins that we commit and the sins that have been committed against us. Jesus did that through his death and resurrection. And if you're here this morning condemning yourself over something that you've done this past week uh, or, or something that's been done to you, you, you might just not understand grace. You, you might be a Christian, but, 
but the reality of God's grace hasn't sunk into your soul just yet. There, there was a Welsh preacher a generation ago uh, named Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, he actually preached 75 sermons on Romans 8. I, I'm not that ambitious. So we're not going to do that. But uh, in, in one of his first sermons on, on Romans 8.1, he said something that was, that was pretty bold. He says, do you know that most of the problems in your life come because you don't really understand Romans 8.1, that in Christ there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that, that most of the troubles you experience in life today come from a failure of realizing the truth of this verse. He, he says, um, next time you're struggling, next time you're in trouble, uh, ask yourself, Uh, That You know, the next time something doesn't go the way you hoped, uh, would I be feeling the way that I'm feeling if I really believe that there's no condemnation for me in Christ Jesus? Um, The the next time that I really blow it as a dad or as a husband, do I I believe that there is no condemnation for me? Uh, When when I feel like I've blown it in my job or if I've blown it uh, at school or at work, do I truly believe that there is no condemnation for me? that all of the, the guilt that I might feel in this moment has been carried away and taken away and laid on Jesus' shoulders so that I don't have to pay for what Jesus has already paid for me. You see, if I believed to the bottom of my toes that there is no condemnation for me, would I be, living, would I be reacting differently in this situation? The answer almost certainly is yes, every single time. And, and once that truth begins to sink into your soul, that there is no condemnation for you, you'll see how that truth sets you free. It, it brings liberation. It, it, it sets you free from the law of sin and death. You see, Jesus says, um, or Paul says in Romans 8, when, when God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, we're set free from sin and death and we're set free for Life live with God by the Spirit. And we'll dive into this idea more next week, but, but here's where we're going to land. You see, because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, that means that in the present moment, we are empowered to live the lives of joyful obedience that God would have us live by the power of his Spirit. You see, notice what Paul is not saying here. He's not saying, you're set free, so now do whatever you want. No, he says the, the law has been... Uh, fulfilled in Christ and is being fulfilled in us as we walk by the Spirit's power in our daily life. That, that the law of God uh, is not something for us to throw away or forget about. It's something that, that actually leads us into the fullness of joy. That God's rules aren't here uh, to limit our fun or to prohibit us from, from enjoying life, but rather these things are here to help us fulfill, uh, have, a, have the fulfillment of joy, have the, have the fullness of life that God offers us. You see, Paul's not saying that the law in itself is bad. He's saying that because of our sin, all the law can ever do for us is crush us and make us feel condemned as if we don't measure up. But now, Paul is saying that Jesus Christ has come and fulfilled the law. So now that the law doesn't crush you, it's now a path that leads you into the fullness of joy. And and see, this is an amazing point because what, what Paul is also saying here is that the reason why Jesus came and lived the life he, he lived for us, the, the, the very reason he died and, and rose again for us is so that we could live a holy life, is so that we could find the law to be something that gives us life and joy, not something that crushes us, that, that the very aim of Jesus' life is to make you holy, to make you the kind of person he intends you to be and the person that really deep down you want to be. And that every time we sin, it's, it's us trying to thwart uh, the very purpose that Jesus lived his life. That the, that the laws of God are not just arbitrary rules given, given to us from some ambiguous spirit from on high, but, but the law of God is, is, is like when we break God's, God's rules, it's like we're breaking his heart. It, it's, it's less like we're relating to a police officer as much as we're relating to a spouse. That when we break those rules, when we rupture that relationship, it's not like we're just breaking a law, we're breaking a heart. And so God uh, gives us the power to, to live a life of love, a love for him and a love for others. You see, because of what Christ has done for us, taking our place, giving up his life, dying the death that we deserve to die, our relationship to God and his law changes. And when you begin to understand grace, you don't see the law, the gospel ethic, as something that prohibits you from joy, but something that leads you to its fullness.
And see what Romans 8, 1 to 4 is showing us is that nothing will separate you from the law, from the love of God. Why? Because Christ was condemned for you. There is no condemnation for us because in Christ Jesus, he condemned sin and death. And that he endured the ultimate separation from God so that we could be welcomed into his presence and never asked to leave it. That, that we can be accepted and, 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 and we can belong. See, friends, there might be many reasons this morning where you lack assurance that God really loves you, that he is for you. But know here in Romans 8, 1 to 4, that there is no condemnation for you, that God is for you because Christ has taken your place. He's borne your condemnation. He is on your side. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's grab hold of that assurance and never let it go. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who has borne our condemnation and who has carried it away, that in Jesus, condemnation is not even a category for us. But Lord, we know this is true, and yet so often we fail to live as if it's true. We're so blinded by our worries. Um, we're so caught in the midst of a spiritual battle, our own immaturity, our sin, and even in the suffering that surrounds us, Lord, that we lose sight of this truth. And we pray that this uh, gem of Scripture, this pronouncement, that there's no condemnation for us, that it would speak a louder voice than all of our fears, all of our anxieties, all our worries. And Lord, that when even this pronouncement doesn't seem real for us, would this table that we come to be a stronger reminder that you are a God who's for us and not against us, that all things will work out for your glory and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.